I have the best job in the world. And I have the best job in the world for two reasons. Firstly, I've somehow managed to find a way of making a living out of being a massively puerile idiot, which for a man with no other discernible talent is quite the stroke of luck. Uh, and secondly, I have the best job in the world because all I have to do all day is find the fun in anything. And finding the fun in everything is not only a great way to spend your days, but it, it's an ace way to spend your life. Because once you tune into what's fun, everything else, no matter how dangerous and difficult, starts to fade away. Over the last 10 years, my organization has done all sorts of bonkers things. We've launched battleships in battle, we've raced uh, lunar rovers in Dover, we've crashed dog sleds in Minehead, and we've done good deeds in Leeds. Thankfully, we've never been asked to do anything in Shitterton in Dorset, but <laughs> whatever else they've been, they've always been fun. Finding the fun sometimes is easy, such as the work we do with the Bloodhound SSC Rocket Car Project, and sometimes it's less obvious, such as the work we do on mental health. But finding the fun for us is really important, because not only does it give us an excellent hook on which to hand the learning, but it's the perfect trap to ensnare the learner. However, what I'm here to talk to you today is not about fun. Well, sort of. What I'd like to talk to you today about is, for most people, the very opposite of fun. So what I'd like to talk to you about today is failure. Now, we think failure can be fun, and we think failure is not only more fun than success, but it's also more useful than success. You see, the problem with success is it only teaches you how hard you need to try before you need to stop trying. It teaches you one way, but that's not the best way or the only way. And we genuinely believe that if you want your kids to succeed, you must first encourage them to fail. Children are not born with any sense of failure whatsoever. Their sense of failure, their notion of failure, is given to them by us. At best, the only failure they understand is the failure to have fun. But what we do is we give them that sense of failure. And of course, to a certain extent, we have a responsibility to give them that sense of failure. Of course, parents must say to their children, look, if you ride your bike towards that wall as fast as you can and fail to break obviously you're going to hurt your face. That will be funny, but wrong. Likewise, teachers have a responsibility to help students understand the repercussions of failure, such to best prepare them for following things in life. However, we think it could be argued that parents and teachers, failure means more to them than it does to students. And, and these differing values of success and failure can often cause problems. If we take for a moment, uh, look at mock exams. If you're a student, there are two approaches to approaching mock exams. The first is to work really, really hard, as hard as you can. And if it works out, you are rightly thrilled that all of your endeavors have paid off. However, if it doesn't work out, not only are you crestfallen, you don't know what to do next. The second school of thought, if you're looking to take your mock exams, is to not really bother, because they don't really matter. They're only mocks. So you don't bother, and when it inevitably fails, you can write it off as a failure to prepare, rather than a personal failure. Both of these experiences fail to prepare you for failure. And we think that's a shame, because there's a lot that can be learned from that failure. For a moment, let's imagine that everybody automatically failed their mocks. Like, no one passed. Because that failure would be definite, schools could plan for that resultant panic. And they could use that resultant panic to not only engender resilience and resourcefulness, but they could also use it to further academic uptake. The problem is, of course, that schools can't do that. They are forced to deal with failure after it's happened, and we think that's too late. Of course, the problem with GCSEs are that they don't really prepare you for A-levels, and A-levels don't really prepare you for university, and university doesn't really prepare you for life, and none of them really prepare you for failure. Preparing for failure is a very difficult thing, most especially if you leave it too late. And the problem is, the longer we leave it, the harder it becomes. We, as grown-up people, mostly grown-up people, are really, really good at making decisions that don't matter, just as a decision not to plan for your mocks. But when it does matter is when it all starts to go wrong. Let me show you what I mean. We're going to play two very quick games of heads or tails. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand up, but not yet, and, and I'm going to flip a coin. If you think it's going to be a head, I'm going to ask you to put your hands on your head. If you think it's going to be a tail, I'm going to ask you to keep it clean. It's a family show. Put your hands on your bum, all right? I'm going to keep flipping the coin. Every time you get it wrong, you sit back down. If you get it right, you stay standing until we've got one person left standing. That person will be our winner. They'll win nothing, because it's a completely random game of chance that requires no skill whatsoever, but they will be our winner. Does everybody understand what we're going to do? 
On your feet, please, my friends. All right, so if you think it's going to be a head, you pop your hands on your head. If you think it's going to be a tail, you pop your hands on your bum. Every time you get it wrong, you sit back down. If you get it right, you stay standing. Are we ready? <laughs> okay, here we go. I can't see suddenly. Okay, it is a head. Sit down if your hands are on your tail, please. Can't see, can't see. Ready? Got a vote? It's a tail. Sit down if your hands are on your head. Here we go, here we go. It's a head. Sit down if your hands are on your tail. Can't see. How many have we got left? Like nine? Okay. All right. Uh, tail, sit down if your hands are on your head. How many have we got left? I can't see. One? Two. Okay, two. Here we go again. Last time. It's a tail. So uh, everybody sat down. Okay, all right. Good. I failed at failing. That's fantastic. Great. That's exactly what I wanted to happen. Okay. Now look. That's a really easy game. Uh, normally at this point I would be congratulating the winner, but well done, everybody. Okay, um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to play that game again. It's going to be the same game and the same rules, but this time one thing is going to change, and that one critical thing is going to change is that now, whereas you were before you were playing for nothing, now you are playing for a big cash prize, like properly big, so big you won't know what to do with it. In fact, can I get an ooh for a big cash prize? Genuinely campest ooh I've ever heard. <laughs> okay, so in a moment I'm going to ask you to stand and you're going to play the game exactly as you did before. But this time, my friends, it matters. There is a price of failure, so I don't want you to fail to think about what you're going to do. Are we ready? On your feet, my friends. Right, you've got to vote or you're out straight away. Here we go. It is a tail. Sit down if your hands are on your head. It is a head. Sit down if your hands are on your tail. Huh, I've lost the coin. It is a head. Sit down if your hands are on your tail. I don't know why I have to make that noise every time. It's become somewhat of a nervous reaction. Sorry. Uh, it's a head. Sit down if your hands are on your tail. How many have we got left? Oh, it's starting to get stressy now. Okay. It is a head. We haven't, we've left one person. Where are you, my friends? Where are you? Okay, can I suggest that this time that maybe we don't both vote for the same thing? Okay, all right, here we go. Are you ready? <laughs> so you're a head, my friend, and you're a tail, my friend. Is it? Oh, no. Two. So how many we got left? Three. 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 Okay, sorry. It's not a difficult game, folks. All right. <laughs> here we go. It's a head. So sit down with your hands on your tail. Are we still going? Okay. It. Uh, how many people have land? I can't see a thing up here, so two. Okay, fantastic. So, and have you gone for different things wherever you are? It's a drum roll on your legs, please, folks. It's a head. Yeah. Round of applause. What's your name, my friend? Do you want to join me up on stage, please, Sue? Come on, come on. Thank you, Sue. Make your way up here through the throngs. Thank you kindly, Sue. Round of applause for Sue, please. Hello, Sue. Hello. One second, let me get you your big cash prize. So, there's your big cash prize. That's for you. Thank you, big round of applause for Sue. Thank you, thank you, Sue. So big, you won't know what to do with it. Okay, um, listen, Sue, I forgot to say, sorry, you can spend that in any folk, fake post office you like, okay? So, uh, so uh, did everybody notice what happened when we played the game the second time? It was the same game and the same rule. The only thing that had changed was the price of failure. But the price of failure influenced the way you started to play that game because suddenly you were making much less good decisions. In fact, an even more interesting thing happened. You stopped having confidence in making any decisions whatsoever. I'm not sure whether you noticed, but as we ended up with fewer and fewer people standing up, those still standing up started asking those people sitting down what they should do, which is a doubly useless notion since those people sitting down not only can't know, <laughs> but they've already proven to be rubbish at this completely <laughs> random game. And that's a tricky thing because once you start to unpick the fact that failure has affected the way that not only you make decisions, but also your confidence in making any decisions because there are, is a prospect of failure, you start to be able to make fewer and fewer decisions. We see this a lot 
in schools, most especially when it comes to students picking their options. Students are, of course, rightly encouraged to pick those subjects with which they are likely to academically excel. But they don't do that. For the most part, they opt for the option of working with their mates, which is fine, except that dynamic has somewhat of a limited lifespan. They aren't all going to live together, and they aren't all going to work together. However, they consider that dynamic to be a successful community. So anything they do within that successful community, like the mocks, won't really matter. They won't have tried anything, so they won't have failed at anything. To try and break this cycle, we ask students... I just suddenly got a glimpse of my massive face. That's... That's a terrifying moment. Okay, we ask students to ask themselves three questions. The first is, what can I do? The second is, what can't I do? And the third is, what else could I do instead? The idea being that foregrounding failure frees up focus. And by making failure the beginning of a learner journey rather than the end, it allows them to catalyze action, especially for those students who, for whom success is an impossibly distant destination. By working on failure and experiencing something that cannot be taught but only felt, it allows them to do that in a carefree environment in which they can work out not only what success isn't, but what else they could do and what else they could do instead. We think that this is a really important thing to do, and it's certainly proven to be really successful. So now, what we do is we try and make things as difficult as possible. In fact, we make everything as impossible as possible. So now, everywhere we go, we make things all about failure. It's no longer about success, it's all about failure. And guess what? Students like it more, and teachers like it more, because failure is felt and it cannot be taught, and therefore leaves a longer-lasting legacy. It's really, really important that they experience that failure now before it's too late later on. So now, now that we've found our way into failure, which is great for me because I was born to fail, it's a really, really good place to start. Instead of just looking for it in the work that we do, we also look for it in other places too. Take this TED talk, for example. This is so not what we do. We don't do teaching. We don't do lectures, we do doing. And everything the students learn from us, they learn from that process of immersion. Likewise, we're not allowed notes or cues or anything up here. And for me, a man recently diagnosed with a serious memory condition, this is really hard. Like, really hard. However, shying away from that prospect of failure would have taught me nothing. And it would have been much less fun than trying. So once we started to think about this from the perspective of why not instead of let's not, we realized we could go even further. Because this is only as hard as it's going to be right now. So let's see if we can make it harder. So what I'm going to do right now for the last couple of minutes of what I'd like to do is I'm going to try as hard as I can to fail. Or better yet, I'm going to ask you to try and make me fail. Because the very worst that can happen here is I can learn something that I didn't already know. And if it works out, and it's not a total disaster, I feel sure you'll feel compelled to get to your feet and wear your hands smooth out with applause. And, and, and if it is a massive disaster, then brilliantly for me, you'll think it's all part of the act, and, and that'll still feel pretty great. But best of all, at least for me, if it is a total disaster, because my memory no longer works, I won't remember it. <laughs> Better yet, I also won't remember it. Now, <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for two volunteers from the audience. And these volunteers are going to come up here on stage, and they're going to try and put me off. They're going to try and disrupt or distract me and do whatever they want, whatever they can, whatever they like, to try and put me off, to stop me saying the last 60 seconds of what I've got to say, which, frankly, I'm going to struggle with anyway. It's going to be their job to do whatever they like. So what I'd like is two volunteers from the audience. Wait, I know of an eminently punchable face, but what I'd like is, let's go for ladies rather than men, because chaps tend to get a little, let's say, punchy when we play this game. <laughs> so uh, can I have perhaps uh, you, madam, and you, miss? That would be splendid. Give them a round of applause as they join me on stage, please. <laughs> thank you kindly, thank you, thank you. Thank you kindly. Now, now just to be sure, um, we, we've never met before, have we? No? OK, all right. So um, what you guys are going to do is you're going to try and put me off. You're going to find everything you need in those two boxes, you know, just like it was in rehearsal, right? And, and what you're going to do is you're going to go out of your way to try and stop me. But you're not going to stop me, right? OK, you ready? Go. 
So they're going to try and put me off, but it's not going to work. Uh, okay, it, it might work. They, they seem quite keen for it to work. But even if it does work, I'm going to learn something new. I'm going to learn something else. Firstly, I'm going to... <laughs> I'm going to learn resilience, and resilience is an excellent skill to give to those students in your class who are easily put off, overwhelmed, or distracted. Like Nice beard. Likewise, it's going to teach me resourcefulness, and resourcefulness is not something that... It's not something that can be learned, it's something that has to be experienced. But most, ah, most of all, it's also going to teach me to embrace failure. Because, just like that first game of heads or tails, what have I got to lose? At the very best that can happen here is that I step outside of my comfort zone and make my comfort zone better, bigger. So here's my point. We think by aiming for success, we're at... That is terrifying. We think by aiming for success, we're actually making it better for students, but we believe we're actually making it worse. So why not make it worse now? Actively worse, wonderfully worse. Why not set traps, make failure your objective and their friend? The only thing failure can't do is fail to help them. So let's work hard to fail more. Setting our sights on success is for suckers, defeat can't be beat. Thank you.